Protecting the world's plant diversity is a crucial part of the activity of any botanic garden and has never been more important. Plants provide us with oxygen, food, shelter, fuel, medicines and a stable environment. And yet a staggering 21% of the world's plants are currently threatened with extinction. I'm Chantelle Helm and I'm going to uncover the stories behind some of the threatened plants growing here at Cambridge University Botanic Garden that have a ray of hope. I want to celebrate the successful plant conservation work of botanic gardens and other similar organisations around the world and give you some reasons to be optimistic about the future. Cambridge University Botanic Garden is one of the biggest and busiest university-owned botanic gardens anywhere in the world. Our main purpose as a botanic garden is to support research that involves plants. The world's facing a number of really big challenges at the moment. How we're going to feed the number of people that are going to live on the planet, how we're going to preserve the biodiversity that exists while feeding those people, and how we're going to manage both of those things in the face of climate change. And research around plants is really helping to address some of those problems. So our living collection comprises about 8,000 species, and they're spread over a 40-acre landscape. Those species come from all around the world. So we have plants from the, the high mountains in the Himalayas, from the Amazon rainforest, from the Arctic, we have species from all across the planet. In addition to uh, our primary function as a research facility for, for the university, we are looking at how we can you know, leverage our skills, leverage our, our expertise in order to build a collection of plants in the garden that can really contribute to saving plants from extinction. And so gardens therefore provide this stopgap, this last minute insurance policy uh, in case uh, serious things happen to the populations in the wild. They also serve as a, uh, a resource by which you can repopulate um, populations that are struggling in the wild. So this is something we call ex situ conservation, so holding, holding species outside of their natural habitat. And that's a very important role that botanic gardens can play. And we now work very closely with our, with our network, with our sister institutions, to understand what they hold, uh, what we hold, and what we should be collecting in a, in a, in a targeted way. And so we're thinking quite carefully um, about um, how many individuals of a species we should hold, how do we capture the most genetic diversity to make the collections that we have meaningful for conservation. And, um, and I think we have tremendous potential as, as institutions, as collective organisations, to have an impact both in terms of the plants we hold, but in also how we use those collections to drive activities outside of our, of our boundaries. With over 3,000 botanic gardens worldwide, together looking after over 100,000 different species of plant, 41% of threatened plants are protected from extinction simply by being part of these collections. We'll start our journey with a plant aptly named Ray of Hope. We grow this plant here in the glasshouse and it's actually a hybrid between an endangered plant called Impatiens gordonii and a rather common cultivated plant known as Busy Lizzy. In 2010 there were only about 120 individuals of this endangered plant left in the wild, growing on two islands of the Seychelles archipelago. In order to save the plant, scientists at the Eden Project decided to create an ornamental hybrid between it and a close relative, hoping to create a poster child for the conservation of rare and endangered Seychelles flora, many of which grow nowhere else. The money raised from selling the plant was given back to conservation, including training local people on how to grow the plant and so ensuring that the species would not go extinct. Next up, our curator Sam Brockington and a learning officer and the learning team, Sally Lee, take us on a tour of a corner of the garden where there are a number of flagship tree species. In a way, this is a bit like this sort of concept of the big five in a safari park. These are some of our, our famous species that everyone will kind of recognize, um, but still um, are, are quite, Im quite important and actually quite rare tree species. So the first is this uh, Sequoia dendron giganteum. This of course is the, the giant redwood uh, and is famous for being the largest uh, tree species in the world. So it normally grows in um, native California and um, 
and even in its native habitat it is threatened. So if you go back when it was first discovered it was intensively logged um, and that's, it was logged despite the fact that in fact it wasn't really very good quality wood and so you had these enormous gorgeous specimens being chopped down and turned into really um, inconsequential uh, material like matchsticks and uh, building woods and so forth. And, but one of the advantages of that period is it really brought the awareness of these trees to the public and they were then protected in their own reserves. However, to this day, uh, because of all of the, the way in which uh, humans are affecting the climate and controlling the environment, um, these trees depend on um, re regular fire cycles for their germination, for their regeneration, and the way in which we've interrupted that means that some of those native populations are, are still struggling to regenerate properly. And I think this is where, where botanic gardens can come uh, into, into their significance. So uh, because this tree is, is quite widely cultivated, um, we had a, a collector, William Lobb, who collected many seeds back in the day and distributed them across the world. It's quite a commonly grown tree in gardens. Hello, I'm Sally with a really special tree, the Wallamy Pine, which is one of the oldest and the rarest trees in the whole world. The species was only discovered relatively recently, in 1994, and before then we only knew about trees like this from what people had seen in fossils. It's almost like a, a dinosaur that everybody thought was extinct was suddenly rediscovered and we've actually got one of those here in the garden only in tree form and we sometimes refer to this tree as our pinosaur. Now it was discovered by a man called David Noble who was out exploring the rainforest in Australia with some friends when he came across a tree that he'd never seen before. David knew quite a lot about plants obviously and he took a sample of it and he sent it on to a botanist it was a completely new species that nobody knew existed. Um, so when news of this new tree discovery hit the headlines, people all around the world were really excited. In particular, as I'm sure you can imagine, botanists were, were really fascinated and they quickly set up conservation and research programmes to find out all about this tree and to protect it. Um, one other great thing they're doing with cuttings is they're growing them up and they're making them available to people all around the world not just to botanic gardens like this one, but to anybody who might want their own wallamy pine. And that's great because it protects the trees in the wild from collectors. It allows them to be enjoyed in botanic gardens and people all around the world can see these fantastic trees. And also all the money that's being raised through sales of those trees is then going back to help with conservation in the wild. So it's a real success story and it's a real win-win for everybody. There's no doubt that species like these are instantly recognisable and can act as flagship species for conservation. Everyone gets excited about those plants that are the biggest or the oldest. Titan arum, also known as the corpse flower, is one of those with its large flowers and bad smell, and it captured the public's imagination when it flowered here in 2017. It's also an endangered plant, but 74 botanic gardens hold it in their collections, bringing its story to audiences around the world. Alex will now give us an update about what's happened with our Titan since it last flowered. Hi there, I'm Alex Summers and I'm the Glasshouse Supervisor here at Cambridge University Botanic Garden. And people may remember our Titan Aaron flowering in 2017. At that point we took the opportunity to pollinate it with pollen that was kindly donated by the Eden Project. And from that process we were incredibly successful and we've reached a point now where we've got somewhere in the realm of about 160 uh, Titan Aaron. And obviously we selected some of those out to grow on to be the next titanariums that we hope to take forward here. But you might ask, what do you do with 160 titanariums? Well, part of being a botanic garden is about access and benefit sharing and also about holding plant material for research. So these plants have seeds that are not orthodox. They can't simply be cold stored and dried. They have to uh, essentially be sown as, as me immediately after they're produced. And so we actually have to hold them as plants if we want to hold them and store them in perpetuity. But equally, we want to make sure that as many people out there, or as many botanic gardens out there, have the opportunity to grow this plant. So the first thing we'll do is we'll share in and amongst the botanic gardens network. But we'll also look to talk to, for example, Indonesia, and see if we can potentially provide uh, Titanarum 
back into their network to show this plan to a public audience it, from a local perspective. So hopefully over the course of the coming years these titanariums will bear fruit. From the forests of Indonesia to the mountains of the Kyrgyz Republic, we're now here the Botanic Garden is involved in saving wild tulips in Central Asia. Hi, my name is Brett Wilson and I'm a PhD student at the Department of Plant Sciences here at the University of Cambridge. And I'm here with the National Collection of Tulips that is maintained by the Cambridge University Botanic Garden. I think the uh, really exciting thing about the, the tulip group is that we know a lot about the spring garden flowers that we see everywhere in the world. But the wild ancestors uh, that grow primarily in Central Asia, we really don't know that much about. We associate tulips with the Netherlands, but in fact, tulips entered Western Europe in the 16th century from Turkey. And these Turkish cultivars were actually bred from many Central Asian species. And so many of the cultivated varieties that have spawned from the ancestral cultivars actually have links to Central Asian populations. However, livestock grazing, opportunistic collection and climate change put a lot of these populations in a precarious position. Our main focus in this project is to answer three questions. How many wild tulip species are there? How many are threatened? And which need to be prioritised for protection? So far in our work, we've located a number of uh, rare species populations, including uh, a rare form of the Tulipa gregii flower. And through our expeditions and alongside our Kyrgyz collaborators, we've collected uh, many seeds for many of these species, and many of which are actually growing here. This is extremely rewarding for myself, uh, because I've seen many of these plants growing in the wild, and now we've managed to secure their future by um, introducing them to collections here in Cambridge, uh, as well as into the Kyrgyz Botanic Gardens and collections at the National Academy of Sciences. Crucially, by expanding ex situ collections like the one here at the Cambridge University Botanic Garden and learning more about the conservation status of wild tulips in Central Asia, we have now ensured that the wild ancestors of our beloved cultivars have a more secure future than they've had for an extremely long time. Next, we head west to Armenia, where a critically endangered pink flowered alpine plant called Potentilla porphyrantha is threatened by a new gold mine. Simon and Sally explain how the Botanic Garden got involved in its conservation. Uh, hello there and welcome to uh, the Alpine Reserve Yard here at Cambridge University Botanic Garden. I'm sitting in front of this really exciting uh, alpine plant, uh, it's called Potentilla porphyrantha, and uh, we've been involved in the conservation uh, of this really rare species that's really only found in about five locations. It's found mainly in uh, really sort of four separate locations in Armenia and about one to possibly two locations in northern Iran. We got involved about four years ago uh, with a gentleman called Chris Davies. He was looking into this plant in how we can basically save it in the wild. It was found on Mount Amulsar in Armenia and they were going to do some gold mining. They were looking to um, uh, extract some gold from the mountain in open cast mines and uh, they found this plant in the endangered species list of Armenia as critically endangered. So um, a group of people, uh, including some representatives from uh, the Botanic Garden, went over, basically dug up the plants from the wild, as many as they could save before the mines came in. So they were then sent to a couple of Botanic Gardens in Armenia. And then through Chris Davies, he got in contact with us and see if we could grow it on and thankfully actually they've all grown they've flowered really really well with us over the last three years since then we've collected seed these are all wild collected and these are the seedlings here that we've grown on and we've now grown them successfully in pots and what we want to do with these guys is reintroduce them excitingly to the new uh, caucus bed that we're developing out on the rock garden and as far as i'm aware it's only uh, and two botanic gardens in armenia that most probably hold wild collections of this of this plant I'm on the rock garden, which is where we hope to plant out this lovely plant of Potentilla porphyrantha. In 2015, I was lucky enough to be involved in an expedition to go and look at this plant in the wild and advise on how to protect it and conserve it in the future. As a result of this expedition and others, 
new plants of Potentilla brantha were found in the wild. Those plants that were under threat from the mine operations were removed and temporarily housed in specially constructed glass houses so that they could remain alive until such time as the mining operations concluded. Although the future of this plant is still quite precarious, there is currently concerted effort to ensure that the wild populations are understood and protected. In addition, there is ongoing research to understand its growth requirements and ecology so that it can be maintained in ex situ conservation collections such as ours, so that future restoration attempts can be made where necessary. So trips to the wild to see plants in their habitat are really valuable to us. Not only does it help us as horticulturists understand really the conditions that plants need to grow and be cultivated well here in the garden. It also gives us an opportunity to collect seed and cuttings from the wild populations and grow these on at the Botanic Garden to make them available for research purposes. And finally we come to a species closer to home. Although this is much less showy, it's no less interesting. And here I am, stood in what seems to be a quite uninspiring patch of grass at the moment. But in summer, this is full of a very rare species, Bromus interruptus. Bromus interruptus became extinct in the wild in 1972, when it was last seen beside a track near Pampersford, here in Cambridgeshire. Luckily, a visionary botanist managed to collect some seeds from this last known population before it went extinct. He germinated the seeds and grew the plants on his windowsill. In 1979 he brought some seeds along to National Botany Conference and with a flourish presented the extinct plant to the delegates. The plants were then cultivated at Kew, seed was then sown at a nature reserve in the Chilterns and a population successfully established. It became the first known reintroduction of an extinct plant into the wild. And although it was still officially classified as extinct in the wild, it can now be found in 14 locations across southern England truly a conservation success story. We obtained some of the original seed presented at the conference in 1979 and have established a very good planting of this lovely grass near the ecological mound by the entrance to the dry garden.